On a day that is one of somber reflection in our country as it has been for the last 22 years. Memorials today in New York, Pennsylvania and Washington DC and all across the country. And later in the hour in Alaska where President Joe Biden just touched down. He'll be making remarks at a September 11th remembrance at a military base in Anchorage. We'll bring those remarks to you as soon as they get underway. The memorials today are also a reminder of the moment of national unity that took place in the aftermath of the brutal September 11th attacks. And if the attacks revealed humanity's capacity for pure evil, people's ability to inflict almost unspeakable horrors on other humans, what happens after 9-11 revealed the best of humanity. Who will ever forget the harrowing images of the all hands on deck rescue effort at the site of the attacks and the national effort to support first responders and victims and all their families and the pledge to never forget. The attacks also fundamentally changed Washington, D.C. for a moment. Officials of both parties, along with former officials of both parties who were in public office at the time of the attacks, attended the events today to mark that. It is an echo of how Americans were, for a while, able to set aside all differences, political and otherwise. And that's the question we asked today, 22 years later. Are we still that country? Can we still do that? Are we capable of that kind of national unity? 22 years later, our republic faces something it didn't have to deal with back then, a grave threat that comes from right here, from within. According to government officials of both political parties, the gravest threat to our homeland right now today does not come from abroad anymore. It is instead domestic violent extremism, and these officials tell us it is on the rise. FBI Director Christopher Wray, appointed by Donald Trump, last year called political violence a, quote, 365-day phenomenon. And there's new reporting today on alarming gaps in the way we handle what is becoming a major focus for the domestic violent extremists themselves, attacks on our power grids. So how do Americans contend with this threat? Today, in this country, how do we grapple with the fact that the threats we face, the threats to our homeland, could come from someone living right next door, from our fellow Americans? Making the situation even more complicated for all of us is the fact that our politics are now intertwined with the threat, the free flow of violent and dangerous rhetoric from one side of the political spectrum means that the possibility that that rhetoric could proceed or lead to a sudden burst of violence looms over us at every moment. But it is a moment of reflection on the state of the country 22 years after the September 11th attacks. That's where we start today. Mary McCord, former top official in the Justice Department's National Security Division, is here. Our friend Andrew Weissman is also back, former top official at the Justice Department and FBI, with us at the table for the hour, former U.S. Senator Claire McCaskill and New York Times Washington correspondent Mike Schmidt. Mary McCord, I start with you. Um, regardless of where the threat emanated from, this has been your body of work for your career. What are your thoughts today? Well, you know, what I reflect on on 9-11 is that attacking critical infrastructure, you know, that was what 9-11 was. Mass transportation is part of our critical infrastructure. And we've seen attacks not only in the U.S., of course, with 9-11, but elsewhere, uh, trying to inflict mass, mass casualties and create really psychological trauma uh, by foreign terrorist organizations. Um, that's what al-Qaeda was doing on 9-11, and that's what other foreign terrorist uh, groups, particularly Islamist extremist groups, have done elsewhere in the world. The attacks here in recent years, and there's a significant uptick that's been documented, um, tend to be not so much on our mass transportation or intended to inflict mass casualties when they're committed by domestic extremists, they, but this rise in attacks on our electrical grids, also part of our critical infrastructure, also characterized as a federal crime of terrorism, are done oftentimes to create chaos, to um, deepen societal divides by trying to suggest to Americans that their government can't protect things, basic things like their power grid, um, and oftentimes used by accelerationists to try to literally accelerate toward societal collapse so that they, in their minds, this means they could, what could emerge from that would be a white supremacist state, a white nationalist, uh, Christian nationalist 
country. And so, you know, attacks on critical infrastructure aren't new. They've been used by mm -hmm. terrorists for decades, um, but the motivation is different. And it is pretty, it, it's really um, sobering to reflect on where we've come over these 22 years from mostly looking outward um, at the signs of danger and concern and banding together, as you in indicated, to try to protect against that foreign terrorist threat. Sometimes, you know, very in, in a way like that you praised Americans coming together, sometimes in a way that unfortunately targeted our Muslim neighbors. Um, and I don't mean neighbors outside this country, although I do mean them as well, but neighbors right here inside this country, in our own communities. You know, now we've come in a very different direction where, as you indicate, the perpetrator of an attack on our power grid, sometimes it doesn't cause a lot of injury. Sometimes it leaves thousands of people without power for days and has been attributed to some deaths. Um, this this threat could come just right, you know, from anyone. Um, domestically who has bought into disinformation, who is, you know, becoming more of an adherent to this idea of white Christian nationalism because they feel perhaps like they've got something that they're losing as we become a multicultural country. Um, and they want they don't want to lose something. And the mm -hmm. way to prevent that is to engage in at least one way of preventing that in their minds is to engage in these kind of attacks. So, you know, I I, I never imagined um on 9-11 that we would be 22 years later talking about this threat at home. Yeah, I mean, I think Andrew Weissman, it's, it's sort of trauma on top of tragedy, on top of trauma, on top of tragedy, right? And the trauma of 9-11, um, uh, I, I still, when I see the local footage of the memorials, I, I cry through all of them. Um, um, but there's the tragedy on top of the trauma, which is, this question we have to ask, right? And I, I want to play, again, this is not us as a program posing this question. These are what government officials throughout the last, I think, three administrations have articulated represents the gravest threat to the homeland. Let me, let me play some of them. Secretary Mayorkas, last year you said that, quote, domestic violent extremism poses the most lethal and persistent terrorism-related threat to our country today. Is that still true? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that continues uh, to be uh, our assessment in the Department of Homeland Security, that domestic violent extremism, uh, particularly through um, lone actors or small uh, groups uh, loosely affiliated, um, are spurred to violence uh, by uh, ideologies of hate, uh, anti-government sentiments, personal grievances, and, and other narratives propagated on online platforms. Since the spring of 2020, so the past 16, 18 months or so, we've more than doubled our domestic terrorism caseload from about 1,000 to around 2,700 investigations. And we've surged personnel to match, more than doubling the number of people working that threat from a year before. We have a growing fear of uh, domestic uh, violent extremism um, and domestic terrorism. Um, um, and both of those um, uh, keep me up at night. Every morning, uh, virtually every morning, I get a uh, briefing from the FBI in uh, both uh, one or the other or both uh, areas. Now, Andrew, by design, um, our country, um, people tasked with protecting our country, like those three individuals, have fewer tools to combat domestic violent terrorism. Um, but I wonder if you think that we are structurally um, in a place that, that should get more attention. Well, first, Nicole, on a personal level, which you sort of started out, I still to this day remember driving my father to work and hearing the first plane overhead, and we thought it was going to the airport not to attack the World Trade Center. And then I saw the second plane, and then from my office in the U.S. Attorney's office watched um, people if they jumped from the tower, which is it's still to this day is unimaginable. Um, when you think about sort of the trajectory that you and Mary talked about, I, you know, I think it is in many ways uh, embodied by Rudy Giuliani. Um, 
that was the day which was his finest moment. And he um, was a statesman and pulled the country together, not just the city. Um, and when you see sort of what has happened to him, it is very much an embodiment of a real fissure uh, and in many ways just sort of an insanity that has gripped our country. And, you know, one way in which I think people are combating this is not just the Department of Justice, where you see many people held to account um, for engaging in domestic terrorism as they, as they should be. But I also think when you see an image of Joe Biden visiting uh, a memorial for John McCain uh, from a different party and being able to be an American and human and decent first, um, that models the behavior that you want to see from a president, regardless of, of politics. And I, I think um, unfortunately, I think that the tools we have are not ones where you look just to the criminal justice system. I, I think that the intelligence community and the criminal justice system are capable of dealing with this. It does pose unique challenges because of the domestic context, as you noted, and because of lone wolves. But I think that because it's a deeper problem that it really has to be addressed in terms of modeling behavior and values that we need to instill in people because we really are very, very lost from where we were 22 years ago.